Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are we all doing? All right. Good. All right, it's good to see all of you. I'm Richard Nelson, the founder and executive director of the Commonwealth Policy Center. And my staff tells me I'm also an author. So uh, thank you for, uh, for joining us. I want to thank the Southern Seminary for having me and uh, the bookstore for hosting this as well. I feel really honored that they put the book, uh, my latest book, up by the cash register uh, also. So uh, I want to acknowledge my staff. I've got several of my staff who are all Southern students or Southern grads. Uh, Christopher Parr, why don't you just raise it, yeah. Alex Ritchie, uh, Freddie Higgins, and Jacob Ogan, the two interns that are working with us. Thank you all for being here and for uh, supporting me and, and helping with this event as well. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, I'm going to open in prayer. And then uh, Colin Smothers is going to pitch some questions to Dr. York and myself. Uh, we'll do that for about 20 minutes. And then uh, we'll open uh, the floor up to questions for you all. Don't leave early because we're going to give away a couple of books, too. Oh, by the way, and I was told that the Southern Bookstore discounted the book, my book, today down to 1099. Is that right, Alex? 1099. So it's a red light special. This is the Kmart equivalent of the... <laughs> Or the blue light special, yeah. one or the other. Dated reference now, by the way. Does that mean I'm old, Herschel? Yeah, yeah, that's what it means. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will do Q&A. Heavenly Father, it's good to be here today. Father, I thank you for this beautiful fall day. Father, I thank you for this uh, institution, Father, where your word uh, goes forth and where pastors are trained and taught um, according to your word. I pray that you'd bless those uh, uh, professors here, bless the students here. I pray that you'd be with us for this event. I ask that you would help to, um, to bring light into this uh, confusing and dark area of politics. And uh, may you be glorified, um, Father, in this. Thank you, and I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, Richard. For those of you that I do not know, my name is Colin Smothers. I'm the executive director of the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. I also serve as the director of the Kenwood Institute, and I teach here adjunctly at Boyce College. And it is my honor and privilege, is, am I staying on here? I need to do something different? To uh, host this panel and moderate with Richard and, and Dr. York here. Um, so Richard, he is the founder and executive director of the Commonwealth Policy Center. Maybe I need a different battery. I'll switch you. And for those of you that, maybe it's just me. You're just bad luck. <laughs> You're bad luck. Okay. So coming. I'm getting the green light. For those of you that don't know about the Commonwealth Policy Center, uh, Richard does work there dedicated to preserving the bedrock values of life, religious liberty, and marriage, and fiscal responsibility, all conservative values uh, there at the CPC. And he's the new author, Sorry about that. thank you, of this book. <laughs> Maybe somebody else needs to moderate. <laughs> Christianity and Politics. Um, so congratulations, Richard. You're also the uh, member of Buck Run Baptist Church, where uh, Dr. York, Pastor York, uh, just retired or moved into... I don't use that word. Okay. Uh, transitioned? <laughs> yeah, that's the word we use. Yeah. It's a dangerous word in some circles, but to the role of Pastor Emeritus, uh, also served as senior pastor there for over 20 years, Great. and uh, he is dean of theology here at Southern Seminary and serves as a preaching pastor. Uh, professor. Well, Richard, I want to begin where you begin in your, the introduction of your book here. Um, you quote from one of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, and I think it's a beautiful quote, and I want to just read it here. He says, Christianity, if false, is of no importance, and if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. And I think that that highlights actually two dangers here before us when we're talking about Christianity and politics. One of the dangers would be to say that Christianity has nothing to do or nothing to say to our politics, right? So it's only moderately important or maybe not important at all in this realm. 
And the other danger would be to say that politics trumps Christianity or somehow is more important than Christianity. So let's just start there. What is a, a, a good Christian approach to the topic of politics? As someone who's a professing Christian, who's been in the public uh, square, the public sphere here in so many years uh, in this role, how does your Christianity inform your approach to politics? Yeah. Just to, to follow up, I'm not on. There we are. There we are. I'll uh, begin to answer that. Um, with what C.S. Lewis was saying, and that is that if Christianity is true, it is of ultimate importance. And uh, I believe that the Bible speaks to all of life, and this includes politics and government and a Christian's relationship to government as well. And uh, I'll take a step back. I grew up in the, grew up in the church. Uh, it was a charismatic church, uh, dynamic worship, lively preaching. Uh, but I was not taught a biblical worldview. And I walked away from my faith in my later high school and college years, and it wasn't until I went to graduate school that I developed a biblical worldview where Christianity was taught as being relevant to all parts of life and related to politics and government, if it is true and if it relates to all of life. The challenge for us as Christians is to uh, seek and to discern and to ask God to help us to uh, to move into that realm or that role of, of government or in of citizenship, if you will, uh, as good Christian citizens. If we're called to run for office, Lord, what does this look like if I'm uh, going to be a candidate? Uh, what does it look like if I'm going to help on a campaign? And that's uh, part of the story uh, in my book. But we begin with the Bible. What does the Bible say? By the way, God ordains government. Uh, Romans 13 makes that clear. We're told to pray for kings and all those in authority over us. Uh, God's concerned about government. Uh, so, yeah. Dr. York, when we think about Christian engagement into politics, what should some priorities be that we should think through? What are some, uh, some commitments that we're not going to compromise on and things that we should absolutely try to bring to the table when we're engaging politically? Our first commitment is to truth, uh, and we have to be, we're people of truth. Uh, we preach a, a word that is true. Uh, Jesus is the truth. So Christians uh, have to be committed to truth, that we are going to uh, believe in policies that are based on the truth revealed in Scripture. Uh, we believe there's natural revelation. It certainly has its place. But we have a special revelation, and we can never act in, in any way that's inconsistent with that, with that truth. And uh, secondly, we believe in doing what is best for our neighbors. Uh, we really believe in human flourishing, that our policies should be oriented toward what is the very best thing for our culture, for our society, <clears throat> for my neighbors. And so with these, I think these two concerns. One is that everything we do is based on truth. Two, that we want to maximize human flourishing. Uh, I think this, th th those two things are really what compel our involvement in uh, the political realm. So I could summarize truth and maybe love, speaking the truth in love, right. applying the truth in love, and in various ways we're engaging. We have those two core commitments because God is truth and he is love as well. Right. That's right. Richard, how long have you been involved in politics, if you were to, to put a number on that? It's uh, 28, 29 years now. I've uh, been involved with a number of Christian public policy organizations and have worked in a couple of states. I've actually run for office myself as well, so uh, have some experience in that. A story that you detail in, in the book, I think, really helpfully. Lessons you've learned, things that you have maybe would have done differently, things that were successful in your political career. So over three decades, um, how have you seen politics change over the years that, that you've been involved? Yeah. Politics is more tribal today. Um, there's less willingness to be able to, from the both sides of the aisle, to meet in the middle <clears throat> and to talk about issues. If you, if you do that, you're often criticized. I've experienced this personally, where if you're willing to meet with somebody on the far side, you're accused of... Uh, from I should say the far side. That was that was a comic. Uh, the yeah. far side. Yeah. Uh, the other side. You. I've been accused of 
giving up ground or, I don't know, a number of different accusations. And that's a shame. As Christians, we should be willing to engage with with all people, right. to be people of truth and people of light, and to not be afraid to talk to uh, talk to those on their side. But the, the anger and the bitterness, that's uh, is is uh, as much as I've ever seen it, and that's and that's a shame. Yeah, it does seem like as politics becomes more totalizing, uh, affecting all areas of life. Maybe the stakes have have maybe been raised. Uh, so with that, be, you know, the political engagement becomes a little bit more fraught. But also, it, it does seem like there is some kind of uh, animating spirit that is is angry and, yeah. and mm. uh, divisive and, and not helpful between even the political parties uh, and political options out there today. Colin, if I could add to that, um, it's disheartening. I expect that in the world, regardless of what side of the political aisle you're on, but when I see it in the church, that's where it's especially troubling. And my experience as I travel the state and speak with different groups, I see a lot of that anger and bitterness in the church. So. Dr. York, you've, uh, as we mentioned before, pastored Buck Run for 20 years uh, in that role. Uh, pastor before that, in many ways, a pastor of pastors here at Southern Seminary and the various roles that you, um, that you uh, inhabit across the Southern Baptist Convention. How has the church, if at all, changed as it relates to being involved in politics over your ministry? Yeah, uh, frankly, it's really been remarkable. Uh, when I first started out, there was a deep sentiment that the church should not be involved in politics at all. Uh, I, I got pressure. I remember when I pastored in Lexington, uh, I remember, you know, just speaking out on particular issues. Uh, you know, you, you, well, you're a political preacher, and I, frankly, I just never was. That's not what I was about. You know, Jerry Falwell, D. James Kennedy, these guys were well-known national preachers, had a national platform, and they did. They majored in that. I mean, you watched Kennedy on uh, Truths That Transform. Yeah, a lot of times he would, you know, there was a political... A subject matter, and of course, Falwell started Moral Majority. I would deal with issues as I came to them in the text, and yet still, if I mentioned it at all, uh, it, it was, oh, you're not supposed to be political. Uh, and then, uh, you know, it, it shifted. Uh, and I have always tried to be committed to the truth, and there were times that put me uh, vocal on one issue, and other times another. Um, I, and I've been an equal opportunity offender. Uh, I've been thrown out of the governor's office twice, both by Republicans. Uh, and, you know, that was a fun experience. Uh, and, uh, but, I, you know, when I pastored in Lexington, I mean, I, I spoke out about issues like, you know, the homosexuality. Thing, uh, but by the same token, when... Uh, we had some racial riots in Lexington uh, because uh, a young man was killed, a uh, young African-American man killed uh, as the police were arresting him. Uh, policeman said that it is, as he decocked his gun, that it went off and shot the young man in the head. We, and we had riots. Uh, I was the only white pastor asked to speak at his funeral. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was just trying to keep my city from burning and down, you know, and it was wild the pushback I got on that, and just because uh, I, I spoke out on that issue. So I've seen I've seen the church sort of go through these different permutations. The left seemed to talk about don't get involved in politics, but today the left is involved in politics. The right is so I, I've sort of I've seen that morph and change. You really do have political involvement now, I, I would say, by both the left and the right, um, more so than when my ministry began. Uh, and yet, I, I'm often dismayed that I still don't see this commitment to just radical truth. Wherever it lands, whoever it offends, whether it lines up with a political party or a candidate or not, just the commitment to speak truth. And I, I really think that the the church needs to just maintain that relentlessly. 
I do wonder how much that encroachment, you know, I heard Dr. Mueller on a podcast recently talk about, um, you know, we're not getting into their turf. They're, they're starting to get a little bit in our turf, yeah, you know, definition right. of marriage and what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman created in God's image. And so as the church seems to be maybe getting more political, is it really that the state seems to be encroaching on yeah. grounds that used to be creation order settled um, issues that, that everybody... Well, absolutely, on? because, you know, this, this wasn't even debated. I mean, you knew there were people who struggled with these things, but society wasn't confused about what the norms were. And then suddenly there's a compulsion. Uh, not only must you have a laissez-faire attitude, you know, live and let live kind of uh, argument. No, no, you must go along. You must, you know, the, the Borg will assimilate you. <laughs> and you had to go along with it. And suddenly you've got to use the right pronouns and all that. And I think people felt that and there really was a, a pushback saying, oh, no, we, we've we not only have we, uh, must we speak out, the reality was we've, we've lost ground here that we've got to make up. I have a, a couple more questions for the both of you, and then we are going to open it up to the audience. If you have questions you're thinking of, uh, go ahead and save those, and, and we're going to have some time to be able to answer those questions. Uh, maybe to both of you, whichever one wants to a uh, answer this question. What do you see as the greatest need in politics at all levels? So local, state, national, regardless, what are the greatest needs facing us as Christians engaging politically today? I would say, Colin, that we need more Christian statesmen, uh, Christian candidates who have a biblical worldview that understand how to communicate well, that are truly working for a uh, the well-being of their neighbor in a society that's flourishing. I would argue that our civilization can't go much further denying God's creational ordinances. Yeah. And by the way, these are Genesis 1 issues. Yeah. Why is human life sacred? Well, because God makes us in his image. The idea of gendered human beings, male and female, that was God's idea. Marriage between a man and a woman, these are God's ideas. And he did it for our good so that we'd flourish and so that we'd glorify him and Christians have something to say about these things. And I would say we've got an opportunity uh, to, to engage, uh, to run for office. We need statesmen, though. We need those who will approach the issues um, well in a, in a respect, uh, respectful way. Uh, you know, being respectable as is, is they engage their opponents on the other side. And I do write about what happens when we do that, when we, when we engage in a, in a God-honoring way. So... Good things happen, by the way. <laughs> so. Absolutely. As we're thinking about Christians engaging in politics, um, we don't want to be pragmatists, utilitarians. We want to think about what ends are righteous and what means are justified to pursue those ends. So how should we think about what is a political win? What, what does it look like to, mm -hmm. to win in politics? Is that even a right way to frame yeah. the issue of, of Christian engagement? Um, how, how should Christians think through political involvement and what does it look like to be successful as we engage in that, in that way? Yeah. So a political win is you get your candidate elected who shares your values, God-honoring values, and he gets into office. A political win is when you have a, a public policy that's enacted into law that is honoring to God. And Colin, in the almost 30 years I've been involved, I've seen um, candidates come and go, good people and bad people, good laws and bad laws. Mm -hmm. And I've come to the conclusion that a political win, even though we want good candidates and we want good laws, but a political win is for Christians to have a faithful presence in uh, positions of influence, whether it's a city council or a board or the state legislature or in Congress. And when and what I mean by this, uh, James, uh, James Davis and Hunter wrote about this uh, many years ago. He wrote a book called To Change the World. And he made the case that Christians have disengaged from culture in a number of different areas. And for us to have a positive influence on culture, we need to reengage. And being faithful presence is the term that he uses. When we're faithfully present, uh, it's not just winning an election or w getting a, a, a law enacted, but it's allowing God to work through us in our day-to-day -day activity, whether it's being present at a board meeting or if you're voting 
on the House floor on a, on a, on a bill or to, talking to constituents, being present according to uh, a biblical view where the Holy Spirit's working through us, that is what we need more of um, in our society. So. And, and maybe the pursuit of human flourishing in that, that we, we want a society that's rightly ordered and, and rightly um, chastened by the justice that, that God determines because this is the world that he, he made. And so that's not interjecting our, our faith or something into the political sphere, but it's actually just acknowledging reality. You know, Christians in a lot of ways are the, the ones who can truly uh, bring reality to bear in, uh, in the lives of our, our neighbors, in our political life together in the city the state and and uh, the national uh, national stage. Dr. York, do you have anything to, to add to that? Yes. Uh, uh, I, I would also remind us that a political win is always temporary because uh, life keeps, keeps flowing. And that's why we have to be so persistent, relentless, have to stay involved because as soon as you have a win, there's another issue or there's another attack on the one you, you just had. So this is why, you know, we, we cannot rest. Uh, while we're alive and have breath, you know, we have to speak for truth. We have to speak for our neighbors, even those who don't think we're helping them. You know, and that's often the, the, the difficulty. You know, there, there, there are people who reject our help and reject our truth but we still have to be persistent, relentless. So, uh, I think uh, everything Richard said is absolutely true. On the other side, a win is just being faithful. If men, we can just stay faithful, whether we're in the majority or the minority. You know, I pastored in Frankfurt for twenty years. I've pastored uh, cabinet members and legislators and most of Buck Run work for the state one way or another. And so I have felt the, the, the floodwaters rise and fall. Sometimes we're in, sometimes we're out. And I, I've just learned you can't let that define your engagement or your commitment. You just have to be faithful whether, whether you're in or out. And I think the Lord honors that in the long run. It's such a helpful word and maybe one that we'll end on uh, for my time of questioning. We're going to open it up uh, to questions from the audience. But we don't want to be those that are tossed to and fro. We want to be those that have our hope and our genuine confidence that the Lord Christ is reigning right now That's right. Uh, on his throne, that we do win in the end uh, because God wins in the end and right. we are his. And so... Yes, we're going to win some. Yes, we're going to lose some uh, down here in the temporary state. But, but our 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 hope and our future is secure in Christ. And what better way to face even next month's elections and and next year's uh, wins and losses? So I think that's a, a good word.